Extinction Rebellion. Oh God. So, you're probably aware. Um, I'm keeping my voice down so they don't lynch me. Uh, you're probably aware that uh, London is being held hostage at the moment, essentially blackmailed by a dark cult of death, which is a bit of an extreme way of putting it. But these guys, these guys, I suppose like only if you've watched a lot of my videos, <clears throat> you know that this area I've talked about a lot, Mar Marble Arch, is where they put these weird, uh, where's it gone? <laughs> Oh god, oh there it is. These weird statues of sort of deathy, deathy stuff. Um, and this site was, you know, a place of public execution for like 700 years. In terms of this area and its uh, interaction with the public, it's always been about death. So it's very apt that uh, the legal place that they've been given, that they can have a camp is uh, essentially the place of public punishment, torture and death. You know what I mean? And, uh, and it's not that I have no sympathy for the environmental cause, because I do, at least the real environmental causes. And uh, as I'll get into in this video, you know, I used to be one of them. I used to be one of these people, the indoctrinated. But I broke out of it. You see, you see, these people think, and they're shouting it from the rooftops, met metaphorically, that um, six billion people are going to die in the next 30 to 50 years, is what they say. Within 30 to 50 years, six billion people will die. That's what they're saying. That's what they're telling the children, which I see as a, a form of, like, child abuse almost, like psychological torture. See look, like symbols of death everywhere. Death. I'm gonna go essentially and uh, tour all of the different sites that they're occupying at the moment, but before I leave here, Marble Arch, which is their main camp, mine camp, sorry, main, main camp, um, I wanna show you something and just sort of tell you that this is the first bit of filming I've done today and just as normal you know I come out quite early in the morning and I bring breakfast with me and you know I generally set up my camera to do time lapses while I'm having my breakfast but I couldn't really eat my breakfast here this morning because of the potent smell this whole area absolutely stinks of <clears throat> a smell that you've probably smelled before the homeless smell, you know, that sort of urine sweat, B.O. thing. It's uh, really quite disgusting here and probably, uh, probably a danger to public health. And I just want to show you this. Hope you're not eating your breakfast as well. This is their combustible toilet. I really don't want to open the door, but there's like a suspicious sort of leakage that is feeding this uh, Let's call it a lake of piss. That is like quite literally 100% concentrated piss. And it stinks and it's disgusting. I, I knew you wanted to see that. But I mean, sometimes when you see people reporting from here, I haven't heard anyone say this place bloody stinks. I'm slightly disappointed in a way. I'm not disappointed um, that Oxford Circus is clearer than it was, but I'm gonna walk down to Oxford Circus. I'm slightly disappointed that the, uh, the police nabbed their pink boat yesterday. There was a pink boat blocking Oxford Circus, but it's gone now. It's a shame, sort of, because it was like mildly photogenic. But anyway, let's go. Is 
actually not many of them left here really. I'm surprised that the uh, I'm surprised that the police aren't um, clearing it but uh, the police are sort of patiently talking to the activists and listening to what they have to say. Let me tell you about uh, well, I'm going to go down to Parliament Square and I'm going to end up on Waterloo Bridge, which is where the main party is happening, I think. And, um, yeah, I want to tell you about my experience that I had with Greenpeace back in the day. It was about 10 years ago, or oh, when I was just a young boy of uh, 32. I, uh, I worked for Greenpeace for about a year and a half, something like that doing you know, festivals and street fundraising and all sorts of other stuff. They sent me up to uh, Manchester to be uh, action trained, as they called it. So it's sort of like a course where they teach you how to do, you know, passive resistance and what to do when you're arrested and all of that kind of stuff. And to be honest, I used to be, you know, I used to be a true believer. I used to believe that, uh, you know, climate change was real and people aren't taking it seriously enough and governments must do action and all the kind of rhetoric that you hear these guys talking about except uh, I broke out of it it was sort of a weird a weird sort of process of me well firstly you know hanging out at the Greenpeace headquarters listening to let's call them the the inner circle of how they talk about the public and that really disturbed me, how little respect they have for the public and how it almost seemed as if they were arguing that people, uh, that it would be okay if people died because that would save the planet. And that made me think, hmm, that's a bit weird. They actually want people to die. I remember once in the uh, Greenpeace field of Glastonbury when I discovered that the director of Greenpeace had uh, had a secret meeting with a, a GM lobbyist, uh, Caroline Spellman, who was the head of like DEFRA at the time, Department of uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs or whatever. And uh, all of a sudden Greenpeace dropped their resistance movement against GM crops. And I had this weird thing where I was like chasing the director around the Greenpeace field trying to talk to him about it and he kept evading me and running away and hiding in tents and peeking out and seeing that I was still there and lots of which yeah, I'm going to get run over. Needless to say, I broke out of the mind control, and when we get out to Parliament Square, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through some of the uh, science, or non-science. But just to say this, that what happened to me then is what is happening now, in that the naive youth, if I can call myself youthful at 32, I've been encouraged to break the law and get themselves arrested, possibly gaining a criminal record, which could spoil their future entirely, on behalf of what is essentially an elite circle who never really put themselves in danger. That noise, by the way, is like Hamleys. Oh my god. They're having a, they're having a great time. Yeah, I, th I think it's very sad that the, uh, I mean, children and the youth generally are quite naive and they tend to. They tend to believe not just anything they're told, but anything they're told by adults that they respect. And uh, the adults say, oh, the end is nigh, the world's going to end. You're not going to have a future. I mean, did you see that little protest at, at Heathrow Airport where there's like a load of kids who had, had obviously, the protest at Heathrow Airport, they had actually got children under the age of 18 to protest because they knew that they would not be arrested because they're under 18. And I find that really, really cynical. The children had a banner saying, are we the last generation? And they really believe it. They think, they think that they're not gonna be able to grow up and then they're gonna die before they reach adulthood. And they, they were like crying and saying, oh no, you know, we're not gonna be able to have a, a family and how I just can't cope anymore like they've they've been they've absorbed so much of like the radical 
nihilistic stuff that's getting pumped out by Extension Rebellion that they sincerely believe to the point of mental breakdown that uh, you know <laughs> the world is going to end in 30 years time. And the way I see it is like climate change or belief in climate change is like a, a new religion. It's almost exactly the kind of indoctrination that used to happen under the Roman Catholic Church in that you know in the Roman Catholic Church you are born into sin and if you don't repent he will burn forever in the eternal fire and the climate change religion is that you are born sinful because you oh my god you're actually made out of carbon you breathe out carbon dioxide it's like you are a sinful being and you must repent um, or the world is going to burn and everything will burn in the eternal fire and just like the Roman Catholic Church it's like it's a way to control people's behavior and make sure that the power elite never lose their stranglehold over planet earth anyway I'm feeling, feeling a bit tired now all this walking about I'm gonna I think maybe fly the next bit <laughs> just joking oh well okay here we go now <clears throat> act act now is this a uh so maybe wanted to be in like a tv show or something uh, learning how to act is that right i mean is it me or like as if the police couldn't move that if they wanted to it seems actually like a conscious oh they got guns out look Ooh. oh We're going to start shooting them, shoot them in the street. It's, uh, it's all very weird, isn't it? It's just, they've just sort of blockaded with just like a few people on each side. The police could easily move this. They obviously don't want to. Um, it's a bit odd, isn't it, that the protesters have cho chosen um, Easter holiday week um, because they, you know, they're urging the government to take action and meet with them, but the government are on an Easter break. Like, there's not a single politician within 100 miles of here, and well, apart from the Green Party, obviously, who are super gluing themselves to zebra crossings. <laughs> oh god! Oh god! Are they dead? Are the dead person in the tree? There are eyeballs in the tree? Says. Uh, Eyes on government inaction. There we go. Interesting. Oh, and the. Uh, it's all fairly occultic what they're doing here. I mean, there's like. You've probably seen uh, news images of like the people who are like crying blood, draped in blood, the blood priests of blood or whatever. Which makes it even more like the uh, Roman Catholic Church. And the, uh, the symbols they use. I mean, the. I found it very difficult to find out like who actually created this symbol in the first place, but their their symbol is very pagan like, isn't it? It's what sort of thing that, you know, hippies have as tattoos. And um having a look at like a few pagan symbols to try and work out what it what might be the archetypal symbolism of it, um looks to me very much like the symbol of possession and the symbol of death. Which is uh, well, fairly apt, really, isn't it? They've done pretty well there. But uh, yeah, Easter as well, you know, paganism, Easter, you know, worship of Mother Nature, uh, the sacrifice of children, uh, blood, blood sacrifice, all that it seems uh, you know, just very apt. And now we're desperately searching for some uh, some shade. It's like scorchingly hot today. It must be. Uh, must be global warming. Sorry, I mean climate change. Um, who was it who said there are lies, damned lies, and statistics? Uh, spoiler alert, it was Mark Twain. But uh, 
Yeah, statistics have always been a very good way to mislead people or to, uh, you know, try and get them to agree to something that actually is not real. Uh, the most obvious lie, statistically speaking, in terms of uh, the whole climate change movement is, of course, the 97% uh, of scientists agree with BS, which is like the easiest thing to debunk in, in the world, seemingly. I mean, anyone surely, I mean, no, nobody, I presume, who bands around things like, oh, 97% of pure, none of those people actually ever um, bother to look up whether it's actually true. It just sounds like a really convincing thing to say, so they, they parrot, parrot it to one another and they tell it to the children and the children say, oh yeah, 97%. But uh, have you ever actually looked it up yourself? Because I have, and I can tell you that 97% of climate scientists do not agree that uh, climate change is man-made and dangerous, like Barack Obama said via Twitter. But if you look it up, and I have, so I'll, I'll show it to you somewhere here, I guess. I'll put it, put it here above the tree of death. Um, yeah, actually, 0.5% uh, of climate scientists agree that uh, climate change is man-made and dangerous and quantify that with data. 66% uh, of climate scientists refuse to take a position. So that, that's, a, that's a, a thing, isn't it? Uh, those people who are old enough to remember it um, will remember that in the 1970s there was a really big scare about global cooling rather than global warming. Um, and that's because, you know, temperatures were dipping considerably and the uh, polar ice caps were, you know, starting to freeze up considerably, making the Arctic, uh, you know, impassable. And uh, if you ever look at any of the graphs that deal with um, Arctic uh, sea ice and uh, all of that kind of stuff, they always begin in 1980. Um, if the graphs were to begin in 1970 or 1960, you would see that there was an unprecedented build-up of ice in the 1970s. So starting the graph in the 1980s, they get to show what is essentially the Arctic returning to what would otherwise be known as normal as a massive reduction in ice. And that's, uh, you know, a very handy alarmist thing if you're in the uh, political, monetized political movement that is uh, climate change. Um, I'm not going to spend an amazing amount of time discussing graphs and all that kind of stuff because uh, not everybody enjoys that sort of thing. But if you're really interested in how the statistics are manipulated and how the graphs are fudged and how the lies are sown uh, you probably you lump, some of you have probably discovered them already but uh, Tony Heller is really good on all of that showing all the historical data all the different times that you know oh the Arctic was going to be ice free by uh, 1990 or the year 2000 and then 2012 and then 2014 uh, famously, uh, Al Gore, wasn't it? He said, oh, the Arctic will be ice-free by 2014, just a few years from now, is what he said. There's another really interesting thing that's going on here in the <laughs> Extinction Rebellion has said that one of their main demands is that um, we should be net carbon neutral by 2025. And you've got all of these people out here going, yeah, we must be net carbon neutral since by 2025 and th these are the people these are exactly the same protesters who were out again and again and again in what was called the people's assembly against austerity dude against austerity so they formed a mass movement to argue that government austerity measures should be stopped and now exactly the same people are arguing or blackmailing the government holding an entire capital hostage to blackmail the government into making sure that we become carbon neutral by 2025 and to do that would mean like unprecedented levels of austerity to the point of like banning cars and banning uh, travel and um, you know switching off our electricity for 12 hours of the day all, all of this kind of like really draconian stuff and uh, it's just odd, isn't it? 
And the people who argued against austerity are now blackmailing the government for austerity of the kind that has never been seen before. We found this blue. Just let you know that. And now we're going to go to uh, Waterloo Bridge. Relax your belly and your chest and feel that heart, feel your hand there holding your heart and smile in gratitude for all of us being here right now. And I invite you to hum. Um, everyone to go off the bridge now and cordon it all off which means everyone's getting arrested and I'm not, I'm not going to be one of them so I left the bridge of my own free will. I want to talk about, well finally, I want to talk about what's most likely really going on here. So uh there's a guy called Roger Hallam. Um, you may have heard of him, I don't know. He's one of the main leaders of, uh, or organizers for Extension Rebellion. It's sort of his uh, brainchild. And he happens to be doing um, a PhD at the moment. So this is all part of his PhD work, which is focusing on um, radical protesting techniques. So in a lot of ways, all of those people up there who are about to be bundled into vans and possibly get a criminal record are sort of like guinea pigs in his science experiment. The way that I see it really is that, um, you know, the, the, the core people involved in that are the core people who are involved with um, Occupy and the people who are part of Climate Camp and reclaim the power and various other um, things. Remember uh, Brian Hoare down at Parliament Square um, where this weird other camp turned up next to Brian Hoare and he put up a sign that said police camp pointing at them insinuating that they were sort of some kind of controlled opposition um, undercover police operation. Well that's those people. Um, or rather those people are some of the core figures who are uh, essentially leading what's going on in particularly Parliament Square right now. Um, do you remember what happened with that other camp in Parliament Square? It essentially got the law changed to make it illegal for any camp to ever be there again. And uh, do you remember what happened with Occupy in that it set a legal precedent to make it in the future illegal to even so much as sleep rough 
in the City of London, essentially a protest movement that was supposed to be against the banks. Its main accomplishment was making homelessness illegal in the City of London. So I just wonder whether that's what's going on here. It's an unprecedented scale of disruptive protests. I think the real thing that will uh, happen with it is that uh, more draconian measures will come into place to make sure that that sort of thing can never happen again. Essentially make protesting completely illegal anywhere in the capital without express permission from Her Majesty's government. So, uh, you know, those people are just essentially being used by an inner circle. I mean, they even call themselves the, uh, the, 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 the circle of council or something like that with a sort of weird paganistic symbol. So it's, it's all really weird. Um, there is a positive message here though, just to end on a positive note. The positive note is, is that there's a lot of youthful people up there who are being told that the world is going to end in 12 years and that uh, you know a mass extinction event humans are going to become extinct in as little as 12 years or maybe 30 years or maybe 50 years uh, the positive thing is well, the positive result of that i think will be that when 12 years has passed and we're all still here and there's been very little change to the polar ice caps and etc um, those people when they're adults might start to realize that when they were younger they were misled by flagrant lies and uh, who knows it might just wake them up <laughs>